All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining me on this podcast. I actually don't know the name of this podcast yet, but we're just going to call it the Electric Dreams Podcast. Uh, today, I have Mickey with me. Um, you guys know Mickey as EVWear. Uh, he's posted tons of videos on electric unicycles. They're super cool. He used to be a color, color grader, professional color grader. I still am. Uh, That's my day job. Yeah, he still is. So his videos look super sick. If you haven't seen them, definitely go check it out. Uh, he also has an Instagram as well. What's your uh, username? So on YouTube, it's different. On YouTube, it's uh, youtube.com slash EVXNYC, I think is the official URL. Um, but as a, it's kind of a thing that gets mentioned, it has to be delineated, but I work with the fashion brand called Everywhere. So they make clothes for guys who ride all kinds of electric vehicles. So I know how it kind of gets confusing sometimes, but their Instagram, which I'm sort of part of, I can chime in on it too, is everywhere.nyc. Um, so since so it's like my best friends, like anytime I make a video for YouTube, they just promote it on there to drive traffic and stuff okay but yeah are they are they making uh clothes specifically for pv riders personal electric vehicle riders or that's yes. awesome yeah that's awesome i think the only other company i know that is doing anything like that is lazy rollers from sweden um but actually before we get started let me just uh, talk about what the show is about so the idea of this show is that we talk about Everything EUC related, obviously, because that's our passion. But we're also going to talk about one wheel. We're also going to talk about eSkate, um, anything that might interest us in the electric field. But mostly it'll be geared towards personal electric vehicles. So micro mobility and urban transportation. Um, we'll talk about future releases. We'll talk about market trends. We'll talk about product reviews. Anything, anything goes pretty much. Um, cool. So welcome to the podcast. Um, we're just going to do some like intros uh how did you start riding because i've been riding for seven years but i haven't seen you i think active until these last two three years right is that yeah accurate? i mean i think i start got in 2016 i got a um segway mini pro that was like my first <laughs> wave into it basically around that time i um well, I'd always seen a Segway when I was a kid and thought it was the coolest thing, but they were like crazy expensive and like my parents were like, I'm not going to buy you a $5,000 toy <laughs> when I was a kid. Uh, so, you know, over the years, finally, they come out with like the, the small one and I saw it. And then when I was living in China for a little while, I saw a few people there with it. And I was like, when I get back, I'm buying one of these things because I found out like oh, it was only like 600 bucks compared to like 5,000 of the original, you know. So I that was my first PEV, if you will. Um, and then I moved into just like after 11 miles an hour, got tiresome. Uh, I looked in, I was like, man, I looked at a unicycle back then. And I decided either the Mini Pro or a unicycle. And I was like, uh, I'll go unicycle. I mean, I'll go Mini Pro because it seems safer. But once it got too tiresome to be going so slow for me, I looked into the unicycle thing and started off with, I think, a King Song 14S. Um, and then I had access to an MCM4 for, for a while, and then I eventually did like a 16S, 18XL, 16X, pretty much a King Song fanboy for the longest. Um, <laughs> and, now, and now I ride the Gatway Nikola 100 Bowl. That's good to hear. Well, you joined at a good time because when the King Song 14S was released, that's basically when the 16S had already been developed, right? I believe. And KS16 was already a long, like, strong product that a lot of people had already bought into. I bought, I bought into this whole market about seven years ago, and this, it was, it was bad. It was like these crappy Chinese wheels, like worse than air wheels, and they're like two, three hundred dollars. And you know, I had to assemble my own battery. It was just a disaster. But it's crazy to see how much. The market has evolved, especially with today's Emotion V11 launch. It's just crazy to think that I was getting actually a little bit sentimental just to see like how far we've come. Seeing my first wheel from the nine bot, I count my nine bot E plus as the first one, but um, before that I had a shitty Chinese wheel. And to the fact that now we have crazy headlights on a wheel, we have amazing handles, we have a three inch wide tire, we have suspension. Like I would have never have thought that seven years ago that we would 
after seven years have this kind of technology in such a compact wheel. Mm -hmm. um, so what was your learning experience like when you, when you got on to an EUC? So uh, I guess, so when I, when I first bought the King song, um, I, of course, went straight to YouTube and just looked up a bunch of videos on like, I guess I had watched some videos prior that led me to buy into the 14S, or I guess I saw a video on the 14D and I looked at eWheels' website. I was like, oh, the 14S is like a bit better spec, so I think I'll go with that. Um, and so I think he's out of the like micro mobility game, but that guy Topher from somewhere Topher? in like the middle of yeah. America, yeah, like yeah. he did like a little, I don't even think he was even that popular back then, but somehow the algorithm showed me his video on the 14D. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, like, it's weird to think now that I make videos for other people, like what goes through the mind of someone who's looking to buy, like, like, like what sold me on it, right? Like his mm -hmm. simple, like just saying like, it's a smooth ride, sold me. <laughs> like, I don't it's know. such a subjective thing now yeah. that I understand like what goes into creating content for people that, want to purchase or are looking to upgrade um but yeah like his simple little review like in a parking lot <laughs> like made me want to get it mm -hmm. I, I i know that channel i think that guy does more car reviews if i remember yeah. and he has a couple of euc videos that were quite popular um i've definitely watched them um at least some of them um okay i think i think i started watching to sean's video i'm not 100 percent sure i definitely saw him writing through Chinatown in Toronto, and I was like, when I got back to China, I was like, I need one. Bought one. Couldn't ship the batteries. Yeah. Assembled my batteries. I, I discovered him much later, even yeah. though I'm in New York in the same place as him. Just sometimes, this is like the, anyone who makes YouTube videos knows this, sometimes the algorithm is just so mysterious. Like, why didn't it show me his video over Topher? Because we're yeah. in like the same location. Yeah, especially when you think back two, three years ago, Tashan was basically the main guy you would go to if you wanted to consume EUC content, right? But now yeah. we're, we're, we have a lot more people creating, creating videos, including myself. <laughs> and now he's uh, unofficially retired from doing it. I, I guess. He's still got sick equipment. He's still, he's still running yeah. the streets. He's just not filming as much. I think, well, he I left, think it's the he editing. Left New York. He left New York? Yeah, he moved to New Jersey. He like bought a house. Oh. And yeah, He's yeah, like yeah. Settling down. Well, I thought I thought that was uh that was just further out in Brooklyn. I didn't think that was out in Jersey. No, no, no. He moved to Jersey. But no, if Tashan's listen, he already knew that I congratulated him on that because you know buying a house is not easy. New Jersey is still expensive. Yeah, so. Totally. Um. Okay. So actually, today's episode is about how how we start on, uh, on an EUC, right? So. Let's uh, let's get started on that conversation. Hopefully, later on we can talk a little bit about the Emotion V11. Um, no one's written it yet, but uh, out of the specs and the the uh, the live stream today, we can talk about it. But okay, so let's talk about how do you start on an electric unicycle? First step, you know you're interested now. You know you're you you want to buy a wheel. What wheel do you go for? It's interesting you ask this because, um, well, ironically, I'm putting out my long awaited first ever, like, you know, learn to ride an EUC 101 video probably tonight or tomorrow or something. So, oh, awesome. um, but oh, oh. the question you asked, which is like, which wheel do you go with, is an often asked question on the internet and it's often met with very wild responses that mm -hmm. I just kind of like roll my eyes at a and yeah. also like people don't know so they'll ask questions like oh I've been looking at like the MSX and also like an MCM4 and you're <laughs> like what? <laughs> what exactly exactly yeah like and I get it like it's not like the car industry which has been around for a while and pretty much everyone understands like this has more horsepower this has less this has all these amenities this doesn't like it, you kind of get that world so this world's a little bit new to people but um if i had to sit someone asked me like what should i get to start out um first thing i'd like to know is like where do they live what's the terrain they're gonna be riding in how are they gonna be using it like are they just gonna be using it for recreation for fun like the guy duff who's actually here in florida um by the way i'm not in new york right now um he uses it not for commuting like we do in new york he's mm -hmm. just like for fun riding around so that initially will help me answer the question for somebody but if you're 
for recreation or maybe you're, I don't know, maybe you're in Asia and you're not a speed demon like the New York City guys and you just want to do some commuting and some fun, like there's a whole list of wheels that you have to choose from. At that point, I would say start with a 14 or 16 inch wheel um, and really just what whatever, I would say always buy the best wheel you can afford. So if your budget is like $1,000, try to buy the best wheel around that. If your budget is five, $600, you're a lot more limited, um, yeah. but try to buy the best wheel around that. Um, but more importantly, some people try to buy or don't understand they shouldn't buy like a, I was trying to teach my sister how to ride my Nikola. I don't think that's a great beginner wheel. Like that's a huge sort of beefier spec you know, really experienced rider wheel, in my opinion. So, so you're I would saying say someone has the budget of, of a Gotley Nicola and you, and they're just starting off. They want to do some off-roading. They want to do some fast commuting. You still wouldn't suggest the Nicola just because of its I think it's a hard – I think it's the weight. The weight of it makes it a hard wheel to learn on. So I okay. would say if you have the budget of a Nicola – Depending on where you are, I know that most places you won't find this, but see if you can find anyone around you who has a cheapy nine bot or, or something that they can let you learn on first. I just feel like it's 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 not impossible, but I wouldn't recommend you try to start with a 55 pound wheel to learn because a lot of the first stuff you're learning is like how to maneuver and hold the wheel up with like one leg, you know, like learning how to just like mm -hmm. take control of it. And like the the weight, I think, is the biggest deterrent to why i would not recommend that but like i said okay. people do it some people they buy an msx first out or or a nicola and it's like you basically the benefit if you purchase a high-end wheel like a big beefy wheel and you spend a lot of money on you dropped a lot of money on it so you kind of have to learn it at that point you can't I, just I've, turn it let's we all know we've seen people buy you know an msx that's like two thousand plus dollars and then try it for two kilometers and realize they can't learn this thing and can just sell it. And we all know that once you own something, it's just like buying a new car. Once it's off the lot, it's worth significantly less. Right. So I, going back, I mean, I think I agree with you. Starting off, figure out what you're going to be using the wheel for is the most important thing. That eliminates a lot of options down already, right? So if you're going off-roading, you definitely wouldn't be going with a 14-inch wheel, right? You'd want a bigger wheel, Perhaps thinking about that three inch wide, even just 2.5. Yeah. 16X would be good as well. Some of the 16 inch wheels, MCMs would be good. But you'd like if you're going off roading, you'd eliminate the 14. You'd eliminate the 14 inch ones, is what yeah. I would say. I mean, there's, I think, I think we're doing a generalization. There are factors that break away from this, but generally speaking, I think that's, that would be the rule of thumb. But yeah, then, I think for a starter, a 16 and a 14 would be where I look first as far as diameter. Yeah. I wouldn't look at an 18 for a starter wheel. Just because with that, I would say exactly there's a one for one of how heavy it's going to be. All 18 inch wheels and above are super heavy. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think the best option is just to buy something used. I mean, I've rented out my uh, my 9 bot yeah. 1E Plus to, to so many people now. It's still only got like 5,000 kilometers on it because the battery takes you nowhere, but it's great to learn on and people can crash it. It's worth like 100 bucks if I sold it on Craigslist. So why not right. teach my community to learn it? They don't have to financially commit. They don't have to worry about crashing my wheel. So that's it, right? So I think like so if I had to pick the perfect learner wheel for somebody, it would be like the V8F maybe. The V8F? Yeah. I was going to say the 16S. But the biggest drawback to that wheel, which is unfortunate, is the pad scenario is just utterly uncomfortable. But I think that would, if it were, if somehow they modded that, if King Song were to like change that to be more comfortable somehow, that would be my perfect like go learn on this wheel. It's, it's interesting that you say that because I think I can't I can't remember which one first. I mean, the VA is definitely a very strong product, especially amongst commuters. Um, and I, I agree with you, but the 16, Kingston 16 is an old wheel. The 16S was just a, pretty much just a speed firmware upgrade, not mm -hmm. much else to it, right? So Was it from like a 16B or whatever was before it? It was actually, a funny story is, 
it was actually a 16A, 16B, 16C, and 16D. And then they removed all those names. Not many people actually knew that those existed. So I'm actually surprised you brought that up. But then they moved, they cut that away, and then they just got the 16S. But I actually yeah. had, I believe, the second or the first Kingston 16 in the market, in the North American market. And that mm-hmm. thing broke like, I don't know, like 50 kilometers. Like I got it the first day and it broke and... I had to pick one up from Jason because I realized how great that wheel was. But I do get that. But it's it's funny you say the reason I say it's funny that you say that is because both wheels don't have much padding. Like the V8 doesn't have much padding, but because the V8 it's is ergonomically thinner, better, yeah, it's yeah. it's thinner, so I guess it's more comfortable. And the six, not that most people would know unless they have this wheel with a 16S. It's sort of like. Uh, similar to the Tesla in the sense of how uncomfortable the padding is at first because the shell is doing this like jut out thing and they put the pads there so like if they were to pad it properly because of the design of the shell it would have to be even wider and it would make it Mm. uncomfortable to to sort of kind of like the Nikola like at first it's like if you use the stock Gotway pads your feet can barely fit on the pedals yeah. Um, so that's like the biggest downfall is like the shell for whatever reason juts out so far. The Tesla is kind of similar, not as bad. It's just higher up on your leg. Yeah. But you know what? With that thing that juts out, it's great for uh, whoops. It's great for jumping. <laughs> I've pinched I'm... that part where <laughs> so you just lift up the wheel. You don't need Kuji pads. You don't need any kind of jump pads. You just go straight up. You pinch I those battery I wish I tried packs. that when I used to own that wheel. <laughs> I never tried jumping <laughs> until recently, but yeah, I, I think what is the price difference? The price difference is like I think four four hundred bucks, I believe, between the two. But between the the, the Kingston can go significantly further. I mean, both both companies have a really good track record of safety, but Kingston is just high the efficiency. S and the V8F. Yeah, yeah, I think the V8F. Well, depending on the dealer, is like just over a thousand or something like that, like eleven hundred, if I remember correctly. And I know, I yeah, know, I in Canadian, it's about eleven, yeah, twelve hundred maybe. Mm-hmm. But usually, the range on depend can be dependent upon like how fast you can go. So if it's a slower top speed, and it was the same battery, you could basically eke out a few more miles. Okay. Hmm. Would you uh, would you wear protection when you're learning, when you're starting out to learn? Oh, yeah. I think most people, they don't want to dive into it that heavy at first, mainly because they, a couple reasons, they spent $1,000 or whatever on a wheel or more, and they're like, gosh, this is an expensive hobby. <laughs> and then when you tell them they should pad up and they look into like all the crazy recommendations of what pads they should use, they're just like, oh, this is just adding up. The Liats, the Liat yeah. shrimp pads and whatnot. Yeah. But I think, as I say in the video that's coming out soon, like at the very least, when you start out, and you're on a learner wheel and you're not going that fast. Um, a good pair of wrist guards and a helmet is great. I would say that if you're on the heavier side, later I think everybody should be wearing a full face helmet. And now we have nicer, lightweight, like the TSGs, but again, that's kind of an expensive helmet. It's expensive, yeah. Um, it's but, half the price of a cheaper wheel. Yeah, so mm-hmm. I I switched my helmet recently to the Liat helmet, which I think is like $115. Mm-hmm. So it's like a lot cheaper. And then obviously, like a bike helmet can cost you like 30 or 40 bucks. So I get it. But I think good wrist pads and a helmet is like the base when you're first starting out. If you can get a full face, I would go for it. One of the things most new riders hear about and dread is like a cutout, what would happen in a cutout. When you pad up fully and you've cut out a few times in those pads, it no longer scares you. Obviously, if you cut out at a super high speed, like if I cut out at 40, it doesn't scare me to do it, but I just know I'm going to be hurting. Are we, are <laughs> we still worried wrecked. about cutouts? Are we still worried about cutouts in 2020 on EUCs? Yeah, I think so. Especially, I mean, you so, and me, we're not, we're not, we're not pushing the limits. We ride to the limit and we stop. We're not trying to like always push that, you know, one right. kilometer. No, I, I think it's more for like probably like heavier guys. Mm-hmm. Um, for whatever reason, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. I'm not trying to be mean, but this sport doesn't attract too many fit people. I think like 
fit people are like, why would I do that? I just, I'll run, I'll bike, I'll go do something else. But I know for, you know, an anecdotal example is there's the guy, uh, Irwin, um, I think he's in Boston or somewhere around there. Um, he's got a YouTube channel too. It's called like Green Cobra or something, but he bought a 16X, which is a beefy wheel, and he overpowered his motor and got a cutout, but he weighs like 200 and something pounds. So I think that's still something to think about if you're buying, if you're if we're talking about new people here, uh, mm-hmm. if you're buying a smaller wheel with a smaller motor capacity, like I, I don't know if I should say this, but I blew through the V8F motor one day just trying to just idle it. Just, just like, okay, where's the, how responsive is it? I wasn't trying to hurt the wheel. Were you going but back and forth or were you just, just celebrating did, really hard? I was doing some idling, just going back and forth because I just okay. wanted to see, okay, how responsive is this yeah, smaller yeah. wheel compared to mine? Mm-hmm. And I did like a couple of times and it like, I heard it like over crank and then it did the in motion like, please get off and it like (laughs) slowly dumped me and i was like whoa so that's a real thing like if you were if i was riding Mm -hmm. you know at whatever that top speed is like 18 or something if i was at the line and then i crank the brake in an emergency stop that you might cut out and fall backwards so that's something to consider if you're like a bigger more specifically a heavier rider Sure, a cutout is something to always be concerned about. And even if not heavier, like if you try hard enough, I I overpowered my Nikola motor recently for the first mm-hmm. time ever. But that's I, that's not got to do with the tire size. That's got to do with the motor. That's got to yes, do with correct. the size of the motor, right? So I usually think there's a lot of people who think, oh, bigger band, wheel, though. it's going to be. Usually it is, but you could pick up an old M Super, which has a lack of power to today's standard, right? So. Okay. I think it's important to remember we're talking about motor power. What is the peak motor output um, and what is its standard output, I guess, which is 2000 watts in in the market right now. It's like at least 2000 if you're looking at a good one. And if you're on the heavier side, you'd be looking at that. Sure. Yeah. So cutout is something to be concerned about if you have a smaller motor capacity. I'm, I'm, I'm not even thinking about cutouts anymore. I haven't. I, I mean, yeah, you been and I on don't that really threshold. worry yeah. about that. That's, I mean, that's like, maybe we could dive into that for a second. Is like, that's one of the reasons why, I think it's like a car, right? Like, you, if you buy a, any kind of car off the street, like, I think my sister drives like a GM or something, just a typical sedan car, I think her speedometer hits 100. Never has she ever tried to go 100 on that thing, but it's got a ceiling it's not exactly the same because we're talking about, I guess, more gas and electricity, but you want a ceiling mm-hmm. enough above where you think you'll be cruising to where you feel safe on it, that you're not going to have to worry about a cutout or anything crazy like that. Well, that's also different because on a car, you have mechanical brakes, whereas this, it's like people have the fear that if you hit that limit and you don't hear the alarms, you're going to fall, right? I mean, that can that can totally happen with... And we're well, what, talking- the only... The only wheel that would do that right now is is a Gotway because it's the only wheel that'll tilt not where you can close the tilt back on a King Song. If you reach that peak, it'll tilt you back, whether you and like I have it or not. seen, yeah, only in, only in New York, uh, I've seen people blow through an 18XL tilt back to cut out. I didn't think that was possible. possible. Po- yeah, yeah, but it's possible. I mean, you're just not thinking straight when you do that. Well, I guess that's enough of cutout talk. I feel like that's going to scare a few people away. But honestly, in short, it's nothing to worry about. Like when you're learning, when you're starting off, you're never going to reach that threshold. Um, Just know that most safety features include a sound alarm and then a second sound alarm, which means more aggressive beeps. And then third, which is a tilt back. And that tilt back is is different for every brand. So in motion and King songs are a little bit more aggressive, whereas on a Gotway, you can choose to turn off a tilt back. Um, I think King Song and In Motion, to their fault, are obsessed with safety. Yeah, like it's a good thing for ninety-eight percent of the riders out there, and like the two percent, like me and some people in New York, it's a little annoying. But so I even think that like if you were to slam into a King Song tilt back unexpectedly, not on purpose, um, you'd be okay. You might you might fall from if you were yes if you somehow just slam into the top end not realizing i don't know you're going down a hill or something like that those things are they're using physics so the the force at which you put into slamming into the tilt back it will push back 
So the only case in which you might fall or from a tilt back scenario is if you hit it extremely hard and it bucked you back extremely hard and you couldn't keep your balance. But 98% of riders would never experience that. They'll, they'll yeah. just slowly like get the tilt and go, oh, oh, I've hit the top end. And our, our battery technology, our motherboard technology between, between all brands is, is quite like the quality control has been really good in recent mm. releases. So it's not something to worry about if you're, if you're thinking about coming into the EUC market and trying to pick something up. Um, when you do buy something old, make sure you, you get someone in the local community to help you test out the wheel, see if this is a reputable seller. Um, but yeah, usually it's not, it's not something to worry about. Um, okay. Um, so, okay. So is, let's just, uh, summarize this. What would your top pick be for someone that's starting out with a little bit of commuting? Maybe they want to go off-roading, just not serious off-roading, not like black diamond stuff, but let's say there's a little bit of rough terrain. What would your pick be? Uh, so it would be from King Song. I think I would go, depending on their budget, either yeah. 16S or 16X. Mm -hmm. That's, that's where I would put it, you know, and then obviously the super off-roader, I would go a whole different category, but I would go like MSX with the knobby tire. Mm -hmm. But that, I that's a very that. specific person. Yeah, I think, I think my King Song 16 that I picked up from from Jason from E Wheels was one of the best wheels. I mean, I loved my M Super X, but that shell was like crap. Like you crash that thing, that thing breaks in half. Yeah. And that King Song, that was that was great, and it took me far. Like the King Song efficiency is just amazing. Mm -hmm. I don't know how they do it. I think my buddy told me it was to do with the cells that they use. Um, but yeah, okay. So our picks are. Mickey's is uh, King Song 16X. Mine is the King Song 16. If you're starting off as a commuter wheel, if that's within your budget, if you're looking for something cheaper, I guess the V8 would be would be something you would consider. Um, but at all costs, stay away from those cheap $200, $300 AliExpress, cheap no-name brand wheels that'll light your house on fire. Remember, you're storing lots of energy in your mm -hmm. house. Most of us, I mean, even though we're not supposed to, charge it overnight. Let's be real here. We all... I stopped. People's, I don't. You I stopped? I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Once, I mean, I think Kuji pointed it out how many watt hours he has in his tiny uh, apartment in, in Beijing. But mm -hmm. I don't have as much. But still, like, even... I think, yeah, all I own right now is the Nikola. And that's enough. Like, I don't play. I need to be awake and alert so that... There's daylight hours I can take care of business if I have to. Well, I I, uh, I usually pick a, a good charging spot where it's close to a smoke detector, um, and I use a slow charger at night. I don't I don't use the fast the fast charger is only for when I'm going out. So, okay. I don't use fast chargers anymore. You don't? I all I yeah. used is you're not riding uh, enough. I have a, I have a splitter. I use two chargers with a splitter to go into my Gotway. Okay, but how many that's still only a slow charge that's only a two amp charger right what i feel like it's six amps i'm doing uh there are two oh, three no, no. Amps. the 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 standard if you have the i don't know what wheel you have For the though. nicola the nicola i'm talking 100 about. volt yeah i think that it's comes with, that's amps. that's a four amp charger that's a four amp charger that they give you oh i'm pushing eight then or, or th actually, it might be a three. I don't think. No, 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 it's a three. It's three. Sorry, it's three. Okay, so I was right. Yeah. Yeah, because the fast charger I got was four amps um, when I had a Nikola, and the standard was a three amp. Standard was a three amp. Yeah. Um, people, just as a side note, it's not really on topic per se, but on topic of charging, a lot of people who have bought the 16X have been reaching out to me lately asking, how do I make this incessant beeping stop when I'm charging my 16X? Um, it's only people who are using fast chargers who this is happening to, and you have to charge it four amps and below. I, I guess they put something in the firmware with the 16X, mm -hmm. with like some of the later firmwares, that if you're pushing more than four amps, I think it's after 60 or 70% battery, it beeps every 20 seconds for some strange reason. I don't really know their whole rationale, but if that's happening to you out there, uh, 
you got to stop using the fast charger at full blast. Mm. It's probably better anyway. It saves your battery. 